now we will move to uh, to um, to an, another aspect of, of the Western Balkans um, uh, ambitions and, and the ideas, and this is the stability and this is uh, security. And now I will give a word to James Mackey, who is from NATO. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Dr. Shentoff was quite modest at the beginning, and he didn't give enough of a plug for the Center for the Study of Democracy. I uh, just would recommend to any of you who haven't looked at the products that they're turning out to, to make sure that you do, uh, because they are required reading from my team at NATO headquarters. So uh, just uh, so because you were modest, I'll be, uh, I don't have to be modest on your behalf. Um, the Western Balkans, and I think all of the speakers before me have said this, it's a region of strategic importance for Europe and the NATO alliance. And stability and security throughout Europe is dependent uh, on what happens here in the Western Balkans. Now, we say this at every single one of these conferences, um, and, and all of us who are in this room are probably convinced of that. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to keep repeating that. Um, because given the many competing priorities that we face for the time and attention of our leaders, um, we need to make the case for why it is worth the investment in the Western Balkans. Why is it important for, to our security and our stability, but also why is it worth that investment? You know, we need local leaders who will also show that if you invest time and money here, you will make progress. Uh, NATO has quite a long history in this region. Uh, both through cooperation and operations. M many of the region, many of the states of the region have become members of NATO, uh, and um, we still maintain a pretty significant presence here through our K4 operation in Kosovo, a NATO headquarters in Sarajevo, and liaison offices in Belgrade and Skopje. And I think this broad presence throughout the region shows our continuing commitment to stability and security but it also shows that our work remains undone or unfinished um, because otherwise we wouldn't need uh, such a continued presence here. Uh, I won't really go into too much uh, diagnosing the major challenges of the region because I think quite honestly, uh, I could sort of ascribe to everything Professor Bieber just said in terms of you know these are worrying trends. I think the one thing that I would say though is that we can't leave these things unattended. I think oftentimes there's a feeling, oh, well, you know, there are problems with security and there are problems with uh, backsliding on governance. And if we leave it alone, it's just going to sort of stay at the same low level of, of not very good. Um, I don't think we can take that for granted. I don't think we can take stability and security in this region for granted. We need to continue to follow the issues. We need to address these issues and we need to make investments uh, to, to move the region forward. Uh, otherwise, we could face backsliding, uh, not just on governance and rule of law, but actually on uh, security in the region. And um, the, the fact that uh, we have a, a very fairly recent history of conflict in this region. Um, so uh, there's a lot, as I said, that could be said about diagnosing what's wrong, but what are we doing about it? What is NATO concretely doing about it? And there's sort of three main areas that I wanna touch on today. Uh, the first is enhancing our political engagement and visibility of the region on our agenda. Uh, despite a truly full schedule at NATO headquarters, from things like Syria to Libya to DPRK to reinforcing our allies in the East, uh, NATO has decided to invest a greater amount of time and energy on the Western Balkans at senior levels. Uh, this means much more regular consultations with regional leaders, both in the region and in Brussels, uh, to hear from them the challenges they face, to explore the concrete measures that we need to take to assist them in addressing those challenges, and to press them on the need to carry out reforms, uh, the reforms that we've agreed jointly. Now, these conversations are not always easy, and I very much take Professor Bieber's uh, point about you know, needing to be more public about some of these criticisms, um, but these types of difficult conversations are necessary and NATO has a unique set of tools to assist our partners in their security challenges. Uh, this includes more than 2,000 training and exercise activities that are available each year uh, to help security forces improve their capability and their capacity and to help defense institutions improve their governance. Uh, and these are available to those countries who sign up to achieve reform goals with NATO. Um, so after a period which I think has probably been too long, the Western Balkans, uh, where they were not that much in our focus, 
uh, we are definitely moving this region up the list of priorities despite the many other competing things uh, that I mentioned. And as the foreign minister said when she was here, uh, there, that includes discussions at the ministerial level. Uh, there was a, a pretty substantial discussion in December on the Western Balkans uh, and then most recently on the 27th of April. Uh, and as the foreign minister also said, we have a couple of difficult uh, challenges and choices ahead of us uh, in the run-up to the NATO summit in July. So the first area is, uh, first way in which we're trying to address this is moving it up the agenda, more high level time and attention, which brings greater focus and resources. The second thing that we're focusing on is deepening our communications efforts in the region. Presenting more information clearly and factually, both in the media and engagements with civil society, it's crucial to addressing the challenges we face. Uh, now, whether that challenge is malign external influence or politicians that are trying to stir up regional tensions to draw attention away from the fact that they are not reforming, um, we need to push back with information. Uh, we need to uh, use information about what we're doing, talk about what we're doing concretely, information about what we hope to achieve in cooperation with the states in the region, and information, most importantly, about the benefits of engaging in reform so that civil society, so that the populations put pressure on their leaders to engage in those reforms. But we have to tell them, we have to tell civil society and the public what we're asking of their leaders so that they can then put pressure on those leaders to achieve those reforms. A key milestone for NATO in terms of public engagement in 2018 uh, is going to be uh, quite a large civil emergency exercise that Serbia will host this coming autumn. Uh, it's going to focus on uh, some of, unfortunately, the challenges this region faces all too often, uh, which is earthquakes, floods, and landslides. Uh, it's going to bring together about 1,800 emergency professionals from all over the Euro-Atlantic region to focus on enhancing regional capabilities and being able to work together more effectively in a time of crisis. And we think this type of exercise demonstrates clearly two things. Number one, obviously the benefits of working with NATO, but number two, the benefits of working across borders, having those linkages and trying to, to build capability and capacity jointly uh, so that uh, the region can address the challenges that it faces. Uh, I also don't have to tell you that uh, this is, given that this is the first NATO exercise ever hosted by Serbia, uh, it's a pretty important milestone for, for the NATO-Serbia relationship. Uh, and um, we're going to try and do our best to highlight this. So the third key area uh, that we're working on, and I think quite honestly this is the most important area, uh, is NATO is enhancing its cooperation with the European Union in the Western Balkans. Uh, these two organizations are deeply invested in the region, and any success in the region uh, is shared between NATO, the European Union, and the states of the region. Um, the coordination between NATO and the European Union starts at the staff level. Uh, my team talks pretty regularly to Genoveva's team. Uh, and what we're trying to do is, first and foremost, coordinate our awareness. So we're actually coordinating the NATO annual assessment with the European Commission's annual assessments. What are we seeing? What are we identifying? And what are the messages we're trying to jointly send, especially on things like governance and rule of law, where both NATO and the EU have an interest? Um, we're making share, sure that we share our expertise across our, our respective areas of interest. And this coordination also extends to higher levels uh, with joint visits by NATO and EU officials to the region and things like Ambassador Danielson coming to brief the NATO Council on the new EU Commission Western Balkan strategy. Um, but I think just as importantly as this coordination, or perhaps more importantly, is finding practical ways for the two organizations to work together in the region. So we're discussing ways to coordinate and deconflict our capacity building activities in fields like cyber defense, countering hybrid activities, ammunition storage and safety, and building up uh, rule of law and governance uh, in different areas uh, of the government. It's still pretty early days, uh, but I do believe that a corner has been turned and we're likely to see a more coherent and joined up approach from NATO and the EU in the Western Balkans region in the coming, uh, in the coming period. Um, progress in the Western Balkans will continue to be dependent on the actions of local leaders. Uh, will they or won't they lead their people to a more prosperous and safer future? Uh, but it's quite honestly crucial that NATO and the European Union together 
uh, provide the assistance needed for these countries to achieve their goals and to provide a realistic perspective about the future of the region, uh, which we believe can be more secure and prosperous for all of the people here. Thank you. Thank you very much.